He's going to be talking about uh, Cuba, continuity, and change. But before we get to that, let me uh, apprise you of some upcoming events uh, that hopefully will be of some interest to you. And before I do that, I'm going to start this clipboard around. If you're interested in knowing more about the Center for Global Justice activities and events in San Miguel, or in general, we do several trips and things like that, um, you can sign up and we send an email out one time a week on usually Saturday that tells you what's upcoming the next week or so. And uh, if you're not already on our list, please sign up and uh, we'll send you some information. Next week uh, in the summer conference ser series, we're doing programs on Wednesdays and Thursdays, both at 11 o'clock, <clears throat> either in this room or in the Sala Quetzal, uh, which is behind us. Next week on Wednesday, we have a film called 500 Years, Life in Resistance. And it's a story of the Mayan people in Guatemala and uh, their history basically since the uh, Spanish invasion, uh, including at least a couple of decades of genocide uh, sponsored in some way, shape, or form by uh, the United States and also the overthrow of a uh, Guatemalan president. So I think that will be a very uh, interesting film. On Thursday, uh, we have a more local uh, activity going on, a talk by Alberto Avalera, uh, who's going to talk on, is tourism ruining San Miguel? Oh. So we'll hear about uh, the uh, urban planning, or perhaps lack thereof in some cases, in uh, San Miguel. Uh, Alberto has experience in several other states and is a very good speaker, so uh, I encourage you to come to that. And the last but not the uh, least important thing that's coming up next week is on Saturday, the center is sponsoring a book launch uh, for a book uh, entitled Hear Me by a local San Miguel author who is actually here this morning, Sally Latch. Uh, <laughs> At 3 p.m. here in the Cafe Santa Ana, uh, she'll be launching her new book. Uh, Hear Me is a collection of interviews that Sally conducted with a variety of, of uh, refugees and immigrants from uh, different countries in the Middle East. And I think that'll be a very, uh, uh, she spent some time on the Greek island of Samos, and uh, this will be about her experience there. So I encourage you to all come for a a little bit of uh, nosh of some kind, and uh, and to hear Sally from, from her books. So now let's get back to today. Let me tell you a little bit about Cliff and his background. Uh, he claims to have been a political activist most of his life, and for those <laughs> of us that know him a little bit, uh, we could say that's probably true. Uh, after growing up in North Dakota, uh, he went on to a variety of academic degrees, including uh, a Master of Arts at Johns Hopkins, and he got his doctoral degree in uh, <clears throat> social philosophy at Florida State University. Uh, he, he taught most of his career at Morgan State University, which is a historically black college in Baltimore, uh, where he taught philosophy. And he moved to San Miguel in about 2002 or four and along with a couple other people started the Center for Global Justice in, uh, in 2004, and it's been alive and well uh, ever since then. Uh, to give him a little bit of credibility for today's uh, talk, uh, Cliff has been uh, participating in, sponsoring, conducting uh, tours to Cuba of one sort or another since 1989. So I don't think we can find uh, a person who's better versed in the uh, the Cuban economy, the Cuban political system, uh, and our own Cliff Durant. So with that, I'll turn this talk over to Cliff. Uh, there's some pamphlets and brochures on the table outside about some of Cliff's books and the center's activities. I encourage you to pick those up. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, being a small crowd, I'm not going to use table and I'm not going to use the mic. Uh, if you can't hear me, move in a little closer, but I'll try to uh, try to project so I don't have to 
use this gadget. Um, today is the um, 65th anniversary of the start of the Cuban Revolution. It was on this day in 1953 that Fidel and Raul and, uh, and uh, a bunch of, that they had organized attacked an army barracks in Santiago de Cuba, hoping to spark an uprising. Um, the uprising didn't happen, and the, the attack on Mancara turned out to be a disaster. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I mean, Fidel was, uh, was imprisoned, later pardoned, went into exile to Mexico, where he organized another group to go back and try again. And it wasn't until 1959 that they finally succeeded in overthrowing <clears throat> a very brutal um, dictator that the U.S. had sponsored, uh, Fulgencio Batista. So in Cuba today, there are celebrations of the start of that revolution on this day, 65 years ago. Uh, my talk, though, is about, not about that, about the history, continuity and change, um, has much more of a present day focus. You know, for the, now for the first time in, in six decades, Cuba has a president who is not a Castro and who was born since the 1959 revolution. The generation that made the revolution is being replaced with a new generation of leaders. Cuba is changing. Yet there is also continuity. The program of reforms that was launched in 2011 has changed much in this socialist country. Yet much remains unchanged. Too much to suit many Cubans who have hopes the new leadership will move things forward more rapidly. Uh, for them, there is too little, uh, there is too much continuity. Well, I've just returned from my annual trip to Cuba, uh, the journey I've been visiting, or the country I've been visiting regularly since 1982, and since 1989 every year. And I want to share with you some of my observations and, uh, um, and reflections on the changes that are underway and the issues that Cuban socialism faces today. Outstanding among them is Cuba's conceptualization of socialism and how to build it. I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the reforms. Um, I want to talk about the new constitution um, that, uh, is, uh, that has just been drafted. Um, so I want to cover a number of different areas. We used to think we knew what socialism was. Um, but back in 2005, Fidel Castro made a striking confession. In a speech at the University of Havana, he admitted that, quote, among the many errors that we have committed, the most serious error was believing that someone knew how to build socialism. Well, that someone was, of course, the Soviet Union. Um, it turned out they didn't have the right formula. And so Cuba, as well as many others, have been striving to reinvent socialism in the 21st century now. Earlier, socialism was thought of in terms of sovereignty, social justice, equality, and human development. These are values that Cuba has sought to realize since the early days of its revolution. And they've done so with remarkable success. While building on these achievements, today Cuba is reconceptualizing its project in terms of these six key words that you hear used a lot. Cuba is to be socialist, sovereign, independent, prosperous, sustainable, and democratic. There are some who would add to this list such things as participatory, um, would 
double underline democratic, and accountability and transparency. Those are things that many Cubans feel need to be improved upon. And these additions imply political changes as well as economic ones. One prominent C Cuban philosopher argues that rather than a state-centric economy, which is what they adopted from the Soviet Union, Cuba needs an integral state with civil society, pointing out that as early as the 1960s, Fidel called for giving more functions to civil society. Another Cuban thinker asserts that Cubans, Cuba's main problem is not economic, it is ideological. Get that right, and it will lead to policies that will grow the economy. Well, with the retirement of Raul Castro from the presidency, all eyes are on the new president, Miguel Diaz-Canel. Born after the revolution, 1960, uh, he has come up through the ranks as party secretary in Santa Clara and in Olguin. An engineer by profession, he's also been a professor. Unlike Raul, who operates quietly from behind the scenes, Diaz-Canel has a popular touch. It is said that during the hard times of the 1990s, he rode his bike to work. Since taking office, now he has toured the country, Fidel style, talking to people in the streets, visiting factories, schools, hospitals, cultural centers, and mountain villages. Significantly, late last month, in an unprecedented move, he took the entire state council, which is the top governing body, to Santiago de Cuba to learn from the example of the party secretary there. The secretary is a modest man who is noted for sometimes dressing like a peasant, peasant and standing on a street corner to see if government vehicles are picking up hitchhikers as they are supposed to do. He will also visit bakeries at midnight to see if flour is being stolen. He's a man of the people. And Diaz-Canel is saying the lead that leadership, that the country's leadership should be too. Through the extensive TV coverage of this trip, this is the message he is sending not only to the leadership, but the whole country. Aside from the uh, highly visible top leadership, a word needs to be said about others who make up the government. Rafael Hernandez, editor of TEMAS, which is the leading um, journal of social analysis, has compiled in interesting information about this. Looking at the National Assembly of People's Power, which is Cuba's legislative body, he finds that 86% of his members are university graduates. 53% are women, and 41% are black or mestizos. Occupationally, 53% are state managers, 27% are workers, and 6% come from co-ops. On the whole, this is a fairly representative cross-section of the population as a whole. There are no millionaires. It's also interesting to look at the composition of Raul Castro's Council of Ministers, you know, Cuba's equivalent of a cabinet. Eight are engineers, eight came from the military. There are five economists, two lawyers, and three professors. Again, we're looking at a highly educated group heading up the state administration. There are no millionaires here either. Diaz-Canel has just announced the new ministers, and with very few exceptions, they are the same. There were a few replacements. The average age now of this new council of ministers, cabinet, is 60. Um, just uh, 10 years ago, the average age was 70, so it's getting younger. Uh, 
consists of 26 men and 8 women. Well, this is the government that is charged with moving the reform program forward. And let me talk about that program and how it came to be. It was exactly 11 years ago, again on this date, July 26, that Raul Castro launched this, the process to reform Cuban socialism. It has been a slow, deliberative process. Uh, using the method of popular consultation that Cuba has devised whenever there are major decisions to be made. There were four years of popular discussion in workplaces, schools, and neighborhoods involving nine million participants out of a total population of some 11 million. And in April 2011, a comprehensive set of economic and social policy guidelines for the party and the revolution was adopted. The pinamentos, or, or guidelines, um, promised mas revolucion, mejor socialismo. More revolution, better socialism. Far-reaching changes were projected to improve Cuba's socialism. A high-level permanent commission was established to oversee implementation of the guidelines over a period of 15 years. So, long-term project. At the heart of the reforms was a shift away from the state-centric model of socialism that had been adapted from the Soviet Union. Under the state socialist model that had informed most thinking around the world in the 20th century, socialism meant state ownership of the means of production and rational planning of the economy in the interest of the working class. This model created a high degree of political consensus and unprecedented economic and cultural advances. State socialism was able to protect sovereignty and assure a high degree of social justice, equality, and human development. I find the level of human development especially noteworthy. Um, Cuba has one of the most highly educated populations um, in Latin America, if not the most highly. One indication of it is that while Cuba has only 2% of the population of Latin America, it has 12% of the scientists in the region. Well, this state socialism was seen as a transition to a future communist society where classes would no longer exist and the state would wither away as society came to be governed by the associated producers. But by the mid-1980s, it began to be realized that the socialist transition was not leading toward the expected outcome. As Olga Fernandez, a leading Cuban philosopher, told me years later, Rather than the state withering away, it was civil society that was withering away. A paternalistic state provided free education, health care, job security, and a comfortable standard of living to a basically passive population. There was a bureaucratization of the state that had taken place, and with that, Though there were ample opportunities for political participation, there was little room for initiative. Well, it's that state-centric model that Cuba now is moving away from with its reforms, while not totally giving up the central role of the state. <clears throat> the reforms over the last decade have aimed to withdraw the state from its dominant role in open space for the development of civil society. It is recognized that the state cannot do everything, nor should it. The guidelines <clears throat> envisioned decentralizing some state functions from the central government <clears throat> down to the provincial and local level. More importantly, 
It also involved opening, opening up a non-state sector of the economy. <coughs> Some 178 job classifications were opened up to self-employment in small private businesses. Self-employment, cuenta propista is the, is the term that they use, self-employed. In addition, <clears throat> it has broadened the concept of social property beyond the state. In December 2012, the urban areas were opened up to worker-owned cooperatives for the first time. While co-ops have long existed in agriculture, now an initial 498 urban co-ops were authorized on an experimental basis. The non-state sector of private businesses and cooperatives have done much to enliven the Cuban economy. The licensed private businesses um, expanded rapidly and currently number 591,456. Although no new licenses have been issued in the last year, the number of urban co-ops has also been capped pending a new cooperative law to establish a framework for this new form of social property. No new co-ops have been authorized since the 498 that were initially authorized. And not all of those actually were established. <clears throat> the halting development of the non-state sector has been puzzling and even troubling to some. Those who want to see Cuba move toward capitalism are troubled by the limited limits placed on private businesses. They see themselves, they see them as the seed from which capitalism could grow. That was the main thrust of President Obama's opening to Cuba. It was seen as an opportunity to promote entrepreneurship. While the US recognized the Cuban government, it did not accept Cuban socialism and sought to promote private businesses. For its part, the guidelines state clearly, quote, in the forms of non-state management, the concentration of property ownership by juridical or natural persons shall not be permitted, close quote. A petty bourgeoisie is permitted but they will not be allowed to grow into a big bourgeoisie, a capitalist class. Well, how is that to be prevented? <clears throat> Taxation and strict regulation are crucial. That has proved to be difficult. Since most transactions are in cash, it is easy to minimize taxes by keeping two sets of books. Since most of these private businesses service the boom, uh, booming tourism, they have become very lucrative. It is because of <coughs> these problems that 16 months ago a hiatus on new licenses went into effect while solutions could be found. Earlier this month, it was announced that new licenses will be issued again beginning this December but there will be new controls, including strictly limiting one business per citizen and requiring all transactions to move through state-run banks. All private businesses will be required to pay taxes. Whether this will solve the problems remains to be seen. This is a highly dynamic sector of the economy and ways will be found to get around any regulations. At the same time, the cooperative sector, with its great potential to expand the socialist economy, is being held back. To be sure, there are problems here as well. And I want to illustrate some of these problems um, by looking at some examples of cooperatives that I've visit visited over recent years. There are basically two types of of cooperatives depending on how they were formed. Most of the new co-ops are conversions from state enterprises. Others 
are self-initiated co-ops formed from a group who organize themselves to form a co-op. <coughs> In the former case, the members are accustomed to the social relations and work culture of a state enterprise with its hierarchical, hierarchical authority structure. The manager was the boss, although he had to clear what he did with higher authority. For their part, the workers had a secure, lifelong job, but little motivation to do a good job. Then, five years ago, the higher authority tells them that you are no longer working for the state, but will, can now become members of a cooperative, responsible for the success or failure of business. Perhaps the manager has been given some training in what a cooperative is, <coughs> But the workers typically had little understanding of democratic self-management. So the former state manager becomes the president of the co-op, and the members continue to follow his or her orders. This is what I observed uh, when I visited a Guayabera workshop in central Havana two years ago. They make this kind of Guayabera shirt with all of the pockets. The president, a former state manager of that enterprise, referred to the 42 fellow co-op members as my workers. The new organization, organizational form had contributed to high productivity with incomes rising to four or five times what they had received as state workers. But the culture of the workplace had not changed. The Institute of Philosophy uh, has been conducting workshops there to educate co-op members about how a co-op should function. But it takes time to teach an old dog new tricks, as the saying goes. Worker passivity is illustrated by a story the Institute researchers told. They had given the co-op a small stove so they could fix coffee. When they returned later, the workers complained the stove didn't work and asked the researchers to fix it. They replied, it is yours. You just have to arrange for the gas. <laughs> workers were just not used to taking initiatives in the workplace. Well, last month, I returned to this textile workshop and found an, a transformed atmosphere has a new president, a man who had joined shortly after it became a co-op, and was elected by its 62 members when the former manager took ill and retired. There was a lively spirit on the shop floor. Their income has now risen to five or six times what it had been as state workers. But when I asked them what they liked most about being in a cooperative, they said, they valued their social relations with one another and the fact that their views are heard. They said this new president is better. And he wasn't present when I asked them about um, their view of him. Building a cooperative is a process. It takes time. The conditions for a six successful co-op are much better when it is self-initiated. One such case is the restaurant, El Bique, which I first visited two years ago, just a few months after it had opened in November of 2015. After um, renovating a former state restaurant that had been closed for 10 years, a group had organized to lease the building from the state and renovate it with a loan from the state bank available to co-op summer at low interest rate. While the work was uh, underway, people would stop by and ask for a job. They were told that they could join the co-op, and many did. So those who formed it knew what they were joining and did so willingly. In effect, the new co-op was a blank slate upon which they could write. They had monthly training sessions on cooperativism. <clears throat> well, when I returned last year, 
I found El Bique had come under criticism. Some said it wasn't really a co-op at all, but just a cover for a private business of a private investor who made all the decisions. This charge is often heard from those critical of co-ops who expect them to become uh, democratically self-managed overnight. Sometimes such criticisms can be on target, but I suspect they often come from unrealistic ideas of what it takes to build a genuinely democratic enterprise, along with a cynical view of the self-interested nature of humans. Let me illustrate this point with a little speculation on how El Bique came under criticism. I don't really know, but here is a plausible explanation. In addition to the restaurant, bar, and pastry shop they originally opened with, last November they added an upscale restaurant on the second floor. Now the first floor restaurant, which was their main thing, um, was more oriented toward the popular classes. But now they've op opened an additional restaurant upstairs um, that's, um, that is much more expensive. The lavish new restaurant must have required some sizable investment beyond any profits accumulated since their opening just a year earlier. I can well imagine that a member with access to money from abroad, maybe his relatives in Miami, was able to make a sizable loan to the co-op. That's, that's perfectly legal. And even though he still had only one vote, the others would support his desire to use it to develop the second restaurant. After all, it's his money, they might have said. Well, that's my most benign hypothesis. If true, it would illustrate one of the ways money can undermine equality among co-op members. <clears throat> There's another problem that has to be overcome in building a democratic worker cooperative. As I've said, self-initiated cooperative members are more likely to understand how a cooperative is supposed to operate. In any case, they've consented to it. However, not everyone comes into it on an equal footing. There's usually one person or a small group who are the initiators. These collective entrepreneurs are the founders who then bring in additional members to the co-op. New members are likely to defer to these leaders. It may have taken some period of time to develop uh, more egalitarian social relations. I suspect it is this tendency to defer to the founders that leads many to criticize the cooperative as just a cover for private businesses. What they fail to understand is that building a cooperative is a process that can take time. The structure of cooperatives can drive that process toward democratic self-management over time. Let me tell you about a third cooperative that illustrates further problems. When I visited it two years ago, I saw it as one of the most successful co-ops I had observed. Cineas, is its name, uh, was an accounting co-op with over 200 members and growing. It provided accounting services for government enterprise only, um, not only in Havana, but across the island. Cineas is a very clever way to get around the ban on professionals offering their services as self-employed, point of propistas. The co-op form allows accountant members to sell their professional services and receive payment from the co-op based on the number of clients they serve. The end result is much the same as if they were in private practice, although they are accountable to the collective. But in effect, they are all par partners in an accounting firm. And they were making 10 times what accountants working for the state could make. As a result, Cineas 
was drawing talent away from state enterprises. Well, to our surprise, in 2017, it was closed down by the government. While the reason for this was never clear, there seemed to have been several factors. Its appeal to state accountants was likely one. They were losing their most talented uh, employees. Also, a former member of Senius told me it was not really a co-op, as the two founders made all the decisions and enjoyed many benefits, like travel abroad. There were complaints from other members that they had not been paid. Such complaints had brought it under scrutiny since 2014. There may have also been concern that Cineus was evolving into a national enterprise that could not be effectively regulated. Some credence to this comes from the fact that one of the new regulations announced soon after Cineus was closed was that co-ops were to be limited geographically to the local jurisdiction where they were established. Well, as you can gather from these case studies, there's more to building successful co-ops than meets the eye. Cuba is learning from what has been nearly a six-year-long experiment how to do it right. The long-awaited general law on cooperatives that will sum up what has been learned, will now have to await the adoption of the new constitution that will establish the legal basis for this as well as many other of the reforms. Well, let me say a word about that new constitution. Maybe you've been reading about it in the, in the media, because uh, it was just uh, uh, last week that the draft was presented to the National Assembly. It is an update of the 1976 Constitution. The changes of the last decade now require a different constitutional foundation. A special commission headed by Raul Castro, he retired from being president, but still has his position as head of the party and head of this commission that drafted a, the new constitution. There, uh, after it goes through the um, popular power assembly, there will then be a nationwide popular discussion of this document um, where suggestions for change uh, can be aired. And then um, the final draft will go through a national referendum for adoption. Among the changes report, uh, reportedly proposed is the establishment of a prime minister to head up the Council of Ministers. That's a new position, you know, basically dividing the role of the president from the prime minister. Um, it establishes term limits on the president to two consecutive five-year terms, and it will create provincial governors in place of the provincial assemblies that presently exist. Reports also say that it recognized new forms of private property, although it's not clear what that means. Private property? There's always been private ownership of personal property such as the house or apartment you live in. And with a license for self-employment, you can use that house for a restaurant. But that business does not have legal status as an entity, and so is not property that you own. That is expressly not a form of property recognized in the draft constitution, although it is something that advocates of capitalism expressly desire. One of the many issues the new constitution will have to deal with is that of wage labor. Uh, I've yet to see how that um, is treated in the new constitution. 
private businesses are able to hire workers. When the Paladars, the home restaurants, uh, originally opened in the 1990s, they were conceived of as family businesses operating in the family home. At first, only family members could work there. But in Cuba, a family can be quite expansive, including cousins and all kinds of relatives. In any case, they were considered self-employed, quinta propistas. Um, now that they can hire other workers, they can grow into middle-sized businesses. But their employees are also still called quinta propistas, self-employed, even though in fact they are not self-employed, but rather wage workers employed by the business owner. And as such, they are exploited in that, in that their work contributes to the profit of the business, but those profits go to the owner. The problem with that is that the present Constitution forbids exploitation. It is explicitly forbidden in Articles 8, 14, and 22. Well, this illegality has been overlooked as the government has seen private business as a way to quickly absorb surplus workers displaced from state employment and informal labor drawn away from black market activities. Besides, the private business sector has contributed to the much needed growth of the economy. So it will be interesting to see how wage labor is treated in the new constitution for a socialist economy. One approach would be to establish a mechanism by which private businesses could be converted into cooperatives. I don't know if there's any discussion of that possibility in Cuba. Um, so this is basically you know, my proposal. I'll send it to the Central Committee. <laughs> as long as the owner works in his business and thus contributes to the surplus value generated, he is not a capitalist, even though there is secondary exploitation of his employees. He is petty bourgeois. But what if the portion of the value created by his workers were to count as their equity in the firm? Then, over time, they could become collective owners of the business. With that, it would become a cooperative, owned by those who work in it, who would be able to participate in decision making and share in the profits. That is basically the mechanism that was proposed in the 1970s in Sweden by Rudolf Meidner for socializing the means of production without expropriating the capitalists. If applied in Cuba today, it would at one and the same time allow for the expansion of small private businesses without exploitation and prevent the private accumulation of wealth while expanding the cooperative sector and social property. As I say, um, I haven't sent it to the Central Committee, but I have sent it to some Cuban friends who have influence. So we'll see what comes. Then let me end by returning to where I started with in this talk, the conceptualization of socialism. Cuba does not claim to be a socialist society. Rather, it is in the process of socialist construction. It is in a transition out of the neo-colonial capitalism it had when it was under U.S. domination up until the triumph of the revolution, January 1, 1959. It is building a new society that is socialist, sovereign, independent, prosperous, sustainable, and democratic, to quote those key words again, with social justice and that nurtures human development. It does that by socializing the institutions of Cuban society. Well, 
what does it mean to socialize an institution? It doesn't just mean the state taking it over and running it. Basically, to socialize an institution is pretty much the same as when we speak of socializing a child. As any parent knows, you socialize your child by teaching the child social values and ways of behaving that enable him or her to live harmoniously with others in society. That is, the parent points the development of the child toward the common good. It is the same when you socialize an institution. You point it toward the common good. For example, you socialize the healthcare system by pointing it away from private profit toward the common good of a healthy society. That is, you make the health resources of society a commons available to all. That is socialized medicine. That's what Cuba has. That's what uh, Great Britain has. Similarly, you common the resources of the natural environment by making them available to all, while governing them in a way that is sustainable. That's what we do when we set aside land as a park for public enjoyment, or establish regulations to prevent pollution of the air, water, or land. You treat those natural resources as a commons. You socialize it. Similarly, you common knowledge resources in public education through a system of schools and libraries. That is socialized education. And in the US, we have had socialized public education um, from early in the 19th century. Similarly, the internet is socialized when it is available in common to all for our shared benefit. Insofar as it is privatized, as the Trump administration is trying to do, it no longer serves the common good, but rather the profit of some. So we socialize the institutions of society when we common together to govern a resource that contributes to our collective and individual well-being. From its historical inception, capitalism has sought to enclose the commons, privatize them, and commodify them so as to be able to realize their value in the form of profit for some. Capitalism is still doing that today. In fact, neoliberalism represents an all-out offensive to privatize everything from education to groundwater, to transportation, to retirement benefits, to public lands, to the postal service, to the penal system, to the military, and on and on. In a capitalist society, we commoners have to constantly struggle to protect the public goods that support our well-being. And that struggle is made all the more difficult by the fact that the state is usually on the side of capital and we have to force it to protect the common good. In Cuba, on the other hand, the state promotes the socialization of the institutions of society. This is not a simple task, as I've tried to show with the cooperatives I've discussed. A co but a cooperative is basically a labor commons in which the members pool their labor in a common good. In a capitalist workplace, labor is also pooled only under the domination of the capitalist and for his benefit. In a cooperative, the labor commons, commoners govern their own collective efforts for their common good. But the socialization of labor aims to, take, to also take into account a larger common good, that of the community as a whole. The socialization of labor in a cooperative is important in the socialist construction because it embeds values of cooperation and commitment to a shared well-being in daily work life. 
thereby fostering a social consciousness, a socialist consciousness. While in the U.S., we are struggling to hold on to slivers of a more just, caring society. In Cuba, they are struggling to forge the new, humane society that will advance human flourishing. Let me end with that and open the floor to questions and discussion. A lot of ideas there. Um, yes. If you want me to expand on everything. estate market. If you wanted, if you needed a larger house, or if you wanted a, a house closer to where you work, um, the city government had a bureau that you could go to and list your house then as available for someone else who might buy it from you, and they would help you identify another house that you could buy yourself. But there wasn't any real estate market. Um, one of the changes that was made just a few years ago uh, in the reform process was to make it possible for people directly to buy and sell their houses. Um, they're, trying, they're trying to avoid emergence of a uh, um, real estate industry with real estate agents um, and um, but there are some who sort of informally serve as go-betweens um, to help people buy or sell uh, residences but you can only own one residence in the city, you can also own a second one at the beach. Um, most Cubans have owned at least that one um, residence. There is, you know, aside from housing, automobiles. Most people, most people who have automobiles own their automobile and can now, you know, sell or trade their cars. That was another part of the reforms that was made. But uh, you know, those have been the forms of private property that uh, are <coughs> the most common. What about the, camp, the combo? What about the, the oh, land? The, the land itself uh, is owned by the state. Um, and uh, you know, so even, even if not only compo land, but also in the city, owned by the state. Um, there are some campesinos who, before the revolution, had owned their land that they, that they cultivated. Um, and they kept that ownership. So you do have that as an example of private property. Um, I visited, for example, a farm outside of Baton um, that has been owned by the family that lives there uh, for four generations. And they still own that land, um, and they can hire workers to work on their land. Um, but that, that's only a very limited private property that has existed up to now. When they talk about private property as a new form, I don't know what that means. 
Sorry, I seem question. anxious about a question because I, I want to stay on this topic for. Yeah, sure. A, so, the the initial uh, housing reform, it seems to me, maybe uh, allowed some to sort of win the lottery and some not. Like that, that it maybe hypostatized existing economic relations because some folks ended up in very nice swanky houses and some people in very small apartments on the side of busy roads. Mm -hmm. So is that like that, I, my further question later is about meritocracy, but I, I'm just wondering, is, this, is, is that fair to say that in fact that, because wealth in a, in a society where you know, we don't have d direct ownership, but we still end up with a better lot than the other seems mm -hmm. to be. A, well, um, when the revolution came to power, many of the people who owned those nice uh, houses went to Miami. Mm -hmm. They left the country. And so their property was abandoned, and the state took it over. Um, in many cases, if it was a large, spacious house, it was divided into several apartments. And people who had very poor housing were able to move into, into that space that was made available. Um, some of that abandoned property ended up becoming um, um, all the offices for various institutes. Um, you know, for example, the Institute of Philosophy that I have um, a long relationship with is in the building that was um, formerly the residence of the architect for the Capitol building. And it's a very nice building, but uh, you know, now it's used by the Institute of Philosophy. It's where they have their offices, it's where they have meetings, they have their library, etc. Uh, a lot of, uh, there, there are a lot of such institutions that have taken over some of that property, particularly in the Miramar section of Rivera. And that's where most of the embassies are located, too. What about Pablo Milanes? Okay. Pablo's house, we've driven by it. It's a beautiful house. Mm -hmm. Pablo's a recognized international artist, obviously makes lots of money. and mm -hmm. But he gets to live a lavish life, though. Yeah. Yeah, don't Cuban artists, um, are frequently able to travel abroad and, you know, concert tour or whatever, or art exhibits, um, and receive U.S. dollars. Uh, and so when they come home, um, they, they have that financial resource as well as maybe some of the consumer goods they might bring with them. Um, and so that creates an economic inequality. But. Um, let me give you an example um, <coughs> of a fairly typical Cuban neighborhood. Um, this is in Miramar. Miramar. It's um, uh, I took a group to a community center there once, and as we drove through the neighborhood, people said, well, "This looks like a very poor neighborhood." Um, because the houses were old, run down, um, the area was congested, and so on. Um, and during the discussion we had with people in the community center, one of the questions that came from our group was, well, what, what if somebody from this neighborhood you know, goes to the university, gets a degree, is able to move up to a good, well-paying job? Can he then move elsewhere, buy a nicer house in a better neighborhood? And the answer was, why would he want to move? <laughs> this is where he grew up. This is where his friends are. This is where his relatives are. Um, what we had seen as a poor neighborhood, actually, in terms of economic levels, was very mixed. There were laborers there. There were taxi drivers there, there were doctors, there were professors, etc., all in the neighborhood. So you don't get 
that kind of you know, economic, Sorry. economically defined neighborhood that <coughs> differentiates one from the other. And even in, um, in Miramar, um, which is, uh, has lots of very nice houses, a lot of the people who live there have very low incomes. You know, they were the beneficiaries of that distribution of abandoned property. I don't know, maybe I've gone on more about housing. Okay. I was, I was You're interested? What, what triggers the integrity within the cooperative? I mean, what, what, uh, what uh, prevents uh, one person from uh, a slacking <coughs> medically or psychologically? How, how, is that, how is that sustained? Okay, um, first of all, a new member of a co-op um, goes, comes in on a probationary basis. Um, and it's only if he proves himself as a good, productive member of the cooperative that he will then be invited to become a member. Um, initially, when these urban co-ops were uh, first authorized, a apprentice or a, a temporary worker could be brought in, but only for, I think it was three months. And they finally decided, well, that's too short a time. Um, they extended it to one year. But at the end of that time, either the person has to be offered a job as a member of the co-op or let go. Basically, the co-op polices itself. The members of the co-op police one another. If someone who is an established member of the co-op yeah, starts gold bricking, you know, his uh, fellow members you know, will, will speak to him and, um, or ask, you know, what's the problem? You know, what can we do to help? Because um, there's a recognition that you know, in a co-op, we're all in this together. And we don't want any dead wood. And if someone you know, just isn't uh, pulling their share of the load, the members can expel him from the co-op. Now, in addition to that, one of the things that uh, um, Cuban researchers on co-ops have been advocating is there needs to be some kind of an umbrella organization of cooperatives that can assist co-ops that are having trouble, or a co-op that has become corrupted or whatever. Uh, there does not exist such an institution yet, but presumably that might be part of the new cooperative law that is envisioned. So, so, the, so the sense of, the, of emotional solidarity within the cooperative um, is enough to sustain are to be self-governing yeah. organizations. I'm just thinking of the emotional component of yeah. the cooperative. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I saw that. Does that have to be taught? Does, I, does, that, does that higher well, order sir, of, of, of sustenance need to be taught? Often or, or does yes. it come about, or is it a natural, quote, natural uh, force inherent in all human beings? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, uh, to cooperate with others is a natural um, instinct that humans have. Um, most of us growing up in a capitalist society have been taught to be competitive rather than cooperative. Um, but uh, human beings have the capacity for either. It depends on which is nurtured. And cooperatives nurture the cooperative side, our higher angels, as it were. Well, you certainly have to limit external input to, to, to keep that viable component. 
Well, you would really have to control. In, in, in a I, sense. I was, honestly, like, in, in, you know, the, the, the media, the external media, uh, would have to be really controlled in order not to trigger, trigger an alternative lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, well, in Cuba, <clears throat> they are operating in a larger cultural milieu, larger social environment that encourages cooperation, um, that encourages working with others rather than against others. Um, and so there, you know, the larger culture that has developed and actually been strengthened as a result of U.S. hostility toward Cuba provides a soil in which cooperatives can flourish more readily. I wonder how the athletic world in Cuba, which is highly competitive, flies a little bit in the face of that. I, I missed the first part. I wonder how the, the, the world of athletics in Cuba, uh, which is highly competitive and, and for the most part successful, mm -hmm. flies in the face of that uh, mm -hmm. and need to be... Uh, uh, well, um, baseball is and now increasingly soccer uh, is, has become a you know, very popular sport. And those are competitive sports, but they also are team sports. And that teamwork is what is emphasized. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Sheila. Um, just a comment, I, uh, this may be apropos. Uh, when I went to Venezuela with a group in about 2005, we visited a co-op that had been one of the older co-ops in existence before Chavez, and they were very successful. They had branched into a number of things. But we were introduced to them with the, uh, the uh, information that they had just been through a great traumatic experience. And we heard that they had been, they'd had about two almost all night meetings because they had to let one of their workers go. And this affected them all very much. They, it was very, very hard for them, but they did it mm -hmm. because he, he wasn't pulling his weight. He, yeah. yeah, the whole bunch of reasons. But we, I could see the solidarity there. With it. Mm -hmm. So imagine in Cuba. So yeah. Same. Yeah. That, now you have to understand that social relations get developed within a cooperative. That, that happens in any workplace, but in a cooperative, it is. Um, fostered by the very structure of the organization. Um, and, you know, that Gryabera workshop that I referred to, you know, in two short years, they developed a different work culture than they had initially. And like I said, what they valued in the co-op was the human relations they had with one another. In the back. You, you had touched on the subject of um, monetary flows from outside of the country and your example of the uh, high dollar restaurant on the second floor and uh, where the money came from, from, from to invest in the, in the growth of that building. What are the, or are there financial controls vis-a-vis uh, -vis other countries of the world that limit the amount of capital that can flow into Cuba and what about capital that flows out of Cuba? Um, probably most of the paladars, the, you know, the private restaurants, have been funded by money from relatives abroad. Um, <clears throat> Cuban Americans are able to send, um, I think now the U.S. regulations allow them to send as much as $500 a quarter. Um, now, five hundred dollars goes a long ways in Cuba, um, and every quarter. You know, so you you can take a house, and remodel it, make it a very very attractive restaurant um, with that kind of money. One of the problems is that most of the Cubans who left the country to the U.S 
and are able to send that kind of money to relatives are white. Um, you know, that the, uh, the elite, the oligarchy in Cuba before the revolution was white. And the blacks were at the bottom of the social scale. Very few of them went to the U.S. They were the big beneficiaries of the revolution. It was those at the top and who were whiter who left. And as a result, their relatives now, receiving those remittances, have an advantage over everybody else. And so the economic inequality that is widening in Cuba, nothing like what it is in the US, um, but it is widening. And that's, that's a matter of concern to the Cuban leadership. Uh, but that wealthier group that is emerging is white. And so you get a racial division that is very, very troublesome. Other question? Is there any word on considering meritocracy, like considering differential um, remuneration for doctors? You know, when, when we go to Cuba, we always hear that refrain that people are working in the service industry, that they're choosing that because of tips, that uh, they're highly, you know, that they're engineers, that they're doctors, that they're teachers. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just curious with you, you know, the new constitution or any of the, the changes afoot, or just your views on it. Um, state employees are paid in Cuban pesos. Cuba has two currencies. In addition to the Cuban peso, there's also the CUC, C-U-C, convertible uh, pesos. They are much more valuable than, than the Cuban pesos. State salaries are low, and people are paid in pesos that don't go very far. Cubans who work in tourism, though, have the opportunity to receive the more valued currency as tips. A waiter in a restaurant or a taxi driver driving tourists around, you know, might be, uh, might be, even if he receives only a one cook tip, that cook is worth the equivalent of 25 Cuban pesos. Um, and so, you know, someone working in tourism in a matter of a few days can earn as much as a state worker does. Now, doctors, you mentioned, yeah. <clears throat> doctors are paid in pesos as state employees. Uh, they're paid very low. What Cuba does is encourage people to go into a profession like medicine because they value being able to help people who are ill or keep people well, keep them from becoming ill. They accept the low pay. Now, there's a joke that, uh, that you sometimes heard, sometimes hear in Cuba. Um, about uh, a fellow, uh, we'll call him Carlos, um, who uh, goes into a bar and orders drinks for, for everybody there and pays for them with hard currency. Um, and people, you know, when he orders a second round of drinks and pays for them with hard currency, um, Someone asks him, where, where did you get that money? Um, and he says, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a hit uh, bellhop at the Havana Riviera Hotel. <laughs> well, that was a plausible explanation of where he got the money. Um, well, he, got, he gets drunk, and a friend takes him home, you know, knocks on the door, 
his wife comes to the, the door and his wife says, oh, you're drunk again, Carlos. Um, and the guy who befriended him says, well, yeah, well, he, he's been very generous with all of us, and, you know, with the money he gets uh, as head bellhop at the hotel. And his wife says, oh, no, no, he's not a bellhop at the hotel. He's a mere neurosurgeon. Oh. <laughs> he's a what? A neurosurgeon. <laughs> he got that money from his relatives in the <clears throat> <laughs> well, Cubans are, are good at making jokes out of, <laughs> out of uh, their situation. Call it gallows humor sometimes. <laughs> uh, since most of us here uh, appear to be expats, what can you tell us about the situation for uh, foreigners wanting to live or work in Cuba? Hmm. Um, the main problem would come from the U.S. government. Um, there are certain license categories that OFAC, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, in the uh, Treasury Department, um, will issue to people, making it legal for them to go to Cuba. Working there is not one. Um, you, you can't go and do anything that provides a benefit to Cuba. I mean, you, you can pay for your hotel room, you can pay for your, um, your meals, you pay for your cab fare. That's legal if you are under one of the kinds of licenses that is authorized. Um, but if you just go there to work, yeah, you're violating the U.S. embargo against Cuba. And uh, whether they I know USians who do work in Cuba, um, but they, they sort of do it you know, under the table, as it were. Um, and if you want to go, if you're, after you retire, you want to you know, settle in Cuba, that's the problem. How do you get your social security? You know, but that, there's no way that that can um, move from an account in the U.S. bank to your hands in Cuba. Unless maybe you have someone in Mexico who receives that money into their bank account and can then transfer it to you in Cuba. There's no direct transfer from the U.S. bank no. to Cuba? No. Are there international banks in Cuba? Um, well, <laughs> yeah, Cuba, Cuba does work through international banks. However, the Treasury Department, the U.S. Treasury Department, pays very close attention to what international banks are doing. Even those that have no U.S. ownership, it might be a Swiss bank, for example. Um, a couple years ago, there was a Swiss bank that was fined a couple hundred million dollars by the Treasury Department for handling dollars from Cuba. Uh, legally, the U.S. Treasury Department has no jurisdiction over a bank that is not you know, U.S. owned. But the Treasury Department is the big elephant in the room. And the bank, the Swiss bank, paid the fine because they also have operations in the U.S. and they don't want to get on the wrong side of the Treasury Department. So are you telling us that the U.S. is not really a free country? <laughs> <laughs> Other questions, comments? Yes. I'm wondering how the uh, education system that's below university level uh, supports the new values of socialism such as co cooperatives. Mm -hmm. Has there been a change in that institution? Well, if, if, if you're asking about the pedagogy that's used, for example, um, I'm, I'm, though I'm a professor, um, I confess I don't know much about the uh, 
primary and secondary educational system in Cuba. Um, but I have visited schools and you see um, slogans, you see pictures of Che Guevara, um, and with the uh, slogan, Be Like Che, who's you know, a model of someone who is committed to building a new society, building new human beings, and able to sacrifice his own individual interest um, to that end. Um, so there are models that are held up. That's one of the ways that it is done. Not only in the schools, but you know, there are billboards on the streets and so on. Not advertising products, they don't have commercial advertising but rather promoting the values of a socialist society. Where do they get all the cell phones? Things that the young kids are using. Now, cell phones have become quite, uh, quite popular in Cuba. Um, and, uh, and now that they've uh, established hotspots Internet hotspots and all throughout the city and in other other cities around the country, you see a lot of people, you know, gathering on the street side on their cell phones, you know, texting to relatives or talking to relatives um, abroad. Do you know if they get Facebook? Can they use Facebook or is it controlled? I don't know. I, I'm not a Facebook fan, so I... <laughs> but you're a member now. I did finally <laughs> sign up last week for a Facebook account. I still don't know how to use it. But then... <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> well, I get the impression that there's a conflict between people, <clears throat> maybe it's mostly young people, I don't know, who... Especially young people. Um, who who um, like the idea of private ownership and uh, working for a profit and a fancier life. You have that as opposed to those who want to <coughs> strengthen the co-ops and the socialist mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. uh, uh, government uh, society. So how would you divide it up? I mean, who, who's pushing? to continue the socialist way? And, and is it a big effort? Um, well, the reform program was uh, designed to, to strengthen socialism. Um, it also has within it the potential to move in a different direction. Um, the son of one of my Cuban friends, uh, Alberto Miranda, um, two years ago, um, was organizing a bunch of his uh, friends to establish a cooperative bakery. Um, this was an idea they came up with themselves. Um, but um, they, um, that, that was when it was decided not to issue any more licenses for new co-ops for the time being. So they weren't able to do that. And, you know, he's lost that dream. But I understand that there are lots of groups that are operating as co-ops. Co-ops without papers, they're called. They're not legally constituted as a co-op, um, but uh, they try to operate as one as much as possible. So the, the spirit is there among the younger generation. But there are also many in the younger generation who are enamored with glitzy image that they have of the United States, where the streets are paved with gold, and, uh, and where if you have relatives there, they can send you big money um, as remittances. And, um, and so there are those uh, for whom the dollar sign gets written in their, in their head. The guide that we had last month uh, for our group Raphael is his name, um, was
was more money oriented than anyone else that I had seen before. Um, how common that is, I don't know, but it's probably more common than, uh, than those who are committed to socialism would wish for. In fact, uh, what Umberto Miranda says, every Cuban youth should have the chance to live in the U.S. for a while, to see what it's really like so that you know, all of the propaganda that's in their heads can, can be corrected. Now, Alberto comes to the U.S. regularly. He um, um, is part of an exchange program at the University of Rhode Island. You know, so he teaches a semester there. Um, and then brings a group of students from Rhode Island to Cuba to experience and study the reality of Cuba. Now, so that, that you know, and he finds that the, the, the opportunity that people have to travel abroad and see the real world can be a powerful educator, um, especially when you look at the US today under Trump. <laughs> you know, the negative aspect is much more visible than it used to be. Well, I was going to ask, uh, do you know how those students reacted, the US students who went to Cuba? I, I don't know. I don't know. Have to, maybe that someday we'll, we'll bring up Mayor to San Miguel, and he can, yeah. and he can talk about uh, uh -huh. the, the reality of Cuba. Uh, anyone who hasn't had a chance to ask a question yet? Okay. You're, you're, you're in charge. I'm sorry. Well, sorry. <laughs> I was just wondering what two more questions. Is there anybody who hasn't spoken yet that would like to? Okay. Go ahead. I, I was wondering what role uh, religion had to play, the institutions of religion in Cuba, mm -hmm. how, how that uh, influences the, uh, the attempt to maintain the integrity of the cooperative pursuit. Um, Early on, the, uh, the revolution was very hostile to religion, particularly the Catholic Church, which had been very tightly connected to the, uh, you know, to the Cuban oligarchy, to the wealthy. Um, what, what else is new? <laughs> very common throughout Latin America, especially. Um, and so, uh, and under the Soviet influence, uh, initially, the revolutionaries defined um, the society as an atheist society. You know, that's the standard you know, Marxist uh, line. But in the 90s, they changed that and uh, changed their attitude toward organized religion toward Catholicism. Um, they invited the Pope. In fact, there have been three Popes during the 60-some years of, of the Revolution who have visited Cuba and have held open-air mass masses in the Plaza de la Revolución um, with, uh, with Fidel standing right next to the Pope. Um, so it's, it's much, uh, much friendlier relationship. But I need to add another point. We tend to think of Cuba as like other Latin American countries, basically a Catholic country. Actually, the popular religion in Cuba is not Catholicism. It's one or another variety of the African-derived religions, which we generally refer to as Santeria. Um, and Santorito was never looked down upon by the revolution. Um, most Cubans, and I've, I've been told this more than once by Cubans, that most Cubans practice some of the Santeria uh, religion. Um, that doesn't mean that they all sacrifice a chicken or um, <coughs> but, uh, they. 
they do relate to them. And that's not just the darker Cubans, but very white Cubans also um, are quite common, commonly practitioners of Santa, Santeria religions. Early in the revolution, within the first year, there was an incident that, um, that had a very powerful effect. Fidel was giving a speech, and doves, white doves were, were released as part of the occasion. One of them landed on his shoulder and stayed there as he continued to speak. Practitioners of the Santa religion saw that as a divine endorsement of Fidel and the revolution. You said, you said in your book that um, Cuba has the highest level of education of all of Latin America. Yeah. It, again, it seems to be a conflict. <laughs> How can they be so well educated and you know still go for this? Um, the, in the United States, there are a lot of very well-educated people um, who practice what you might consider superstitious um, things <coughs> like uh, religion, magic, <coughs> magic whatever. Um, no, it's not that surprising. Okay, thank you all very much for coming and uh, try to join us next week, especially for our book launch on Saturday right out here. And uh, thank you. Let, let, let me make a couple of announcements. Last week we had a panel.